Good morrow, sir. It is most fortuitous that you have discovered this electronic video, for if perchance you have come seeking knowledge, amongst these musings you shall find no less than 16 vital fragments of information paramount to your success on your journey to conquer Dragon's Dogma 2. Mayhaps you stay a while, settle yourself by the fire with a quill and parchment, ready to scribe the valuable wisdom I wish to impart on you today. Oh, and also hit like and subscribe and comment, please, because writing my script like this took me bloody ages, and I've got loads more Dragon's Dogma 2 content on the way, so it would be much appreciated. Thank you. And also, as we're moving into tip one, I'd like to thank Capcom for sponsoring this video. Anyway, my friends, with that nonsense out of the way, let's jump straight into the top things you need to know to help you understand and defeat the world of Dragon's Dogma 2. The first few tips will be all about pawns, with the first one being perhaps the most important, and this is to know and understand the four primary pawn inclinations. Unlike you, pawns don't just have vocations, they also have inclinations. These can kind of be viewed like subclasses, and they are just as important to take into account when building your party, because they will drastically change how your pawns act, both in and out of combat. Let me give you a rundown of the key attributes of the four inclinations, and my top suggestion of how your party should look. In no particular order, firstly we've got straightforward. The straightforward pawn make for excellent scouts. They will spot enemies from further away than any other pawn, and usually even further away than you. So having at least one straightforward pawn in your party means it is going to be very unlikely that you will be ambushed. And for this reason, it's fantastic if they have a frontline vocation, such as a fighter or a thief. Next up, we have got the simple inclination. Simple pawns are adventurous and therefore fantastic at finding hidden treasure. They are also very generous and will often gift their finds to you. For this reason, I would always advise having at least one simple inclination pawn in your party. Honestly, the amount of hidden chests and crafting materials my simple pawn has found for me that I have missed is innumerable at this point. Your simple pawn doesn't really need to be any particular vocation, so stick it on whichever one you want, really. Next up, we have got the Calm Pawn. Calm pawns are shrewd and efficient. This makes them incredibly resilient in battle, often being the last one to fall. However, be careful with this type of pawn, because due to their shrewd nature, they will also dispose of unneeded items of their own initiative and won't ask you first. So be careful what you ask them to carry, because if they deem it unneeded, they will just dispose of it for you. Therefore, this is the one pawn inclination I feel it's okay to drop from your party in favour of the final type, the kind-hearted. As the name suggests, kind-hearted pawns are fantastic healers and support classes. Their main priority is buffing allies and rushing to the side of anyone in need. And because the mage class has a heal by default, this is my recommendation for your starting vocations. This is exactly what my party looked like, and it was so damn powerful. Me, as an archer, I had my fighter as the straightforward scout, I had my thief as the simple treasure hunter, and my mage as the kind-hearted healer. The four of us synergize so damn well and make this incredibly challenging game just a tiny bit easier. Following on directly from inclinations, tip number two is to change up your support pawns frequently as they do not level up with you. That does mean that it's hard to have your absolutely ideal party 100% of the time. However, tip number five will help you achieve this. For now, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Tip number two is just to remember to change your two support pawns frequently because they do not level up with you. So even if they synergize really well with your party, you don't want to be giving them all your new gear because they will take that with them. And apart from giving them new gear, they do not level up with you. 
and because it's not advisable to give them new gear, you can't boost their damage this way. So especially early game, they're going to fall behind quickly and they will not be able to pull their weight in a few levels time. So keep that in mind and definitely at least for the first 10 to 15 levels, don't get attached to your support pawns. Be used to changing up your party very, very frequently. Tip number three is to make your main pawn as appealing as possible to get them hired by other Arisen. If you didn't know, your main pawn can be hired by other Arisen as one of their two support pawns. And as much as it is in the real world, a good looking, very appealing character is gonna get hired more often. Make sure they fit the role, make sure they're geared up well, and make sure people want to hire them and venture with them because there are two huge advantages to your main pawn being hired. Firstly, you will get rewards. You can set a quest. If a player has had a good time with your pawn, when they send them home, they can offer to provide them with a gift. This gift will go in your inventory as a thank you for how well your main pawn performed. Also, the more adventures they go on, the more rift crystals you will get when they come back. Rift Crystals are the main currency used to hire pawns that are a higher level than you, but also later on in the game, this is a form of currency needed to buy some very specific, very rare items. And sorry, I've just realized there's a third reason. Thirdly, and perhaps even most importantly, is the fact that when your main pawn stumbles upon things in other players' worlds that you haven't found, they will come back and they will relay that information to you. When you're then questing through an area, they will literally say to you, oh, I was with another Arisen the other day and they showed me this chest. Do you mind if we go and see it? And interactions like this are very frequent, both with support pawns that you hire and with your own main pawn. And talking about these suggestions and these ideas that pawns have for you, this transitions us perfectly into tip number four. And this is all about the go command. You can issue four commands to your pawns and they have in combat and out of combat uses. And the most powerful of the four is go. As soon as a pawn has a suggestion, somewhere they want to go, some loot they found, something they want to show you, a direction that they suggest, if you say go, that is your way of telling them, yes, okay, show me what you want to show me. This will then be represented by a hand icon on that pawn's nameplate. They are now effectively the leader for the next portion of the journey until they complete their suggestion or you tell them to stop. The other way this will stop is if they are interrupted by a battle, but do not worry if this happens once the battle has finished and you've picked up your loot and you've all had a little party, you can just say go again and they will resume the action that they were already doing. It is that simple. If you were wondering exactly what it does in combat, go makes your party spread out and act very independently. This is great for big enemies or enemies with AOE attacks. The others I won't drone on about because this is already going to be a massive video and I'm pretty sure they're all very self-explanatory. Tip number five is a bit more specific than the others and I'm not sure if this is achievable for all PlayStation players. So forgive me if it's not because this requires you to be playing online. But basically, tip number five is to always check out the unique pawns on offer. At level one, unique pawns are insanely powerful due to the fact that you do not need to spend any rift crystals to hire unique pawns all the way up to level 10. And trust me, for a new player, this game is really hard. I am not scared to admit that the first time I did the tutorial, I died to the first three goblins. This game doesn't hold your hand and combat takes a long time to get used to. So use any crutch you can until you get better at the game. And this is the absolute best crutch you can use. Having two unique support pawns, both at level eight to 10, whilst you're still at level two, is going to be fantastic. It's gonna make the early game so much more manageable. Trust me, it doesn't make you feel overpowered. It doesn't feel cheap. It just puts you on a level playing field whilst you're trying to learn the game. So if you do have that online play option available to you, that's the only way you can access unique pawns and they will be a really big help early game. Once you get to level 10 and you can hire level 10 pawns for free, this then becomes irrelevant. So even if you can't make use of this tip, don't worry, it's still doable. It's just a little bit tougher. 
And the sixth and final porn related tip for this video is to always be on the lookout for new rifts to unlock. You can go and interact with these broken rifts around the world and they all have a different and unique mechanic. Once you have unlocked these rifts, it's very easy to utilize them. Go back to any main hub town and when you go into the rift there, you can then choose which of these rifts you have unlocked out in the open world that you would then like to apply to your current rift. For example, this one will make all of the pawns on offer be of the kind-hearted inclination, which is fantastic when looking for a new mage companion. Another secondary reason that you want to be on the lookout for these new rifts to unlock is sometimes they will yield one-off special pawns. These pawns will usually be a significantly higher level than you, however they can be recruited for free. At this point, my entire party was around level 11 and I just came upon a level 18 mage. So as you can imagine, my mage, get out of here, you're useless now. Let's get this level 18 mage in my party. And we are now gonna stomp things for the next few levels. Now that you've had an overview of pawns, let's move on to some of the more general tips. Next up, stamina management is absolutely key in this game. You do not want to run out of stamina mid fight because if your stamina bar depletes entirely, it will not regen for a long period of time. You will stand there completely defenseless, completely out of breath, and one of your allies will have to run over and give you a little pat on the back and a little pep talk to get you back into the fight. So even though it is slower as you're moving around the open world, quite often it's more beneficial to just jog rather than sprint. Also, if you do opt to sprint around, if you are running through an area that you're pretty sure is safe, be very aware how drastically different stamina costs are, depending on the terrain that you're running through and if you're going up or downhill. As you can see here, going uphill and going downhill, not only am I going significantly faster downhill, but the stamina drain is drastically different. And this happens when running through grass, when wading through water. So many things affect your stamina that you always want to keep it at the forefront of your mind. It is very, very important. Next up for tip number eight, you want to visit shops frequently and have a chat with the shopkeepers, even if you're not planning on buying anything. Becoming friends with vendors is a thing you can do and it is a thing that you should do because they will sometimes yield rare items that you cannot find anywhere else. Any interaction with a shopkeeper is going to boost that friendship a tiny amount. Buying things from them is obviously going to improve your relationship more than just talking to them, but the absolute best thing you can do is give them gifts. You can give any shopkeeper pretty much every single item in the game if you want to, but please note there are much more efficient ways to do this. Firstly, there are items that are specifically designed to be given as gifts, just like the bunch of flowers here. And secondly, every single person has their own unique personality. And if you check them out in the encyclopedia, you'll see their preference for gifts. And you can use this to determine what items are going to raise their friendship levels faster. Also, another side note, wandering peddlers are the absolute best shops to become friends with. They have the best rare finds and they are easier to level up than shopkeepers. Probably because they're rare, right? you're not going to see them as frequently and it's a little bit random chance whether you bump into them. So they want that payoff to be a bit more significant when you do. Tip number nine is a very harsh mechanic that made me lose hours and hours of progress. And this is the options to load from last save and load from last in rest should you die. You need to treat this game as if you are running with Iron Man mode turned on. There is one save and one save only, and that is the last time you rested at an inn. There is also an auto save function, so you could argue that there is two saves, but primarily this is just in place for if you need to quit out of the game. And due to this, should you need to use the load from last save function, you will incur a loss gauge. The loss gauge is a semi-permanent reduction to your maximum health that can 
only be regained when you rest the night somewhere. So the more you die, the more you load from last save, and the more you try and retry a fight, the tougher it's going to get because the less and less your maximum health will become. Please also note the one massive mistake that I made and how I lost so much progress. I assumed that loading from your last inn rest also included camping because resting at an inn and resting at a camp both remove your loss gauge and restore you back to full maximum HP. So I thought they were both one and the same thing. They are not. When I clicked load from inn, it took me five hours back to the very start of the game. And then, when I tried to quit out and hit load from last save, well, because I've loaded from the inn, the inn is now my last save, so you've just lost your last five hours of progress. Both your last save and your inn save are the very first inn right at the start of the game. When you are level two, do it all again. So do not make that mistake. Be very, very, very careful. Remember where you last rested at an inn, because that is your only true save point. Tip number 10, you will unlock quite a lot later in the game. You're probably talking 10 hours of playthrough, depending on how thorough you are being. But when you get to the first proper main city, you will unlock the ability to upgrade your gear. Do this immediately. All gear has three upgrade levels, and the first upgrade level just requires a tiny amount of gold to do so. And in comparison to how cheap it is, it gives you a really decent buff to your gear, and this can be applied to both your weapons and your armor. So every time you purchase or loot a new piece of gear, make sure that one of the first things you do is bring it somewhere you can upgrade it and get that up to level two or even level three as quick as you can, because it makes a drastic difference. For this next tip, as with many other mechanics in Dragon's Dogma 2, it does not hold your hand. It very much plays like an old school RPG. And to that end, all loot in the game has very minimal flashing. In proper RPGs from the early 2000s, you would have to figure out by looking at and clicking on every single thing whether it was lootable or not. There is a small visual representation of whether something is loot, and at night time that's a lot more prominent, but it's far less in your face and far less obvious than most RPGs nowadays. So look carefully, or you can and will miss lots of very valuable loot, because it doesn't flash at you properly in your face like many other new games. And as we are already on the topic of being eagle-eyed when looking out for loot, explore everywhere. Trust me, spend so much time exploring. Not only do you need to gather lots of money, lots of loot, lots of experience, lots of items, because it is a very hard game and you need all the help you can get. Also, there are 240 Seekers tokens throughout the game. And when you collect enough of these, they start to stack up and give you insane rewards. For the very final reward, you need at least 220 of them. And some of the weapons, some of the rings and other items from the Seekers token rewards are just insanely good. So everywhere that you possibly think they could have squeezed in one of these tiny little coins, go and check it out. I've just thought of something else this second actually, which is gonna be like a tip 12.5, because it's on the topic of loot. Always keep your eye out for these golden scarabs that you see primarily on trees. As soon as you find one, use it straight away. What that will do is it will add a small amount of additional carry weight for both your Arisen and your main pawn. Only your Arisen can use it, and it will automatically add it to both of them at the same time. Already only around 30 hours in, my bags are constantly getting full. I am constantly lugging around medium to heavy loads. Without finding, looting, and using all of these golden scarabs, I can only imagine how over-encumbered my characters would be. Tip number 13, expanding on my first Dragon's Dogma video about which vocation you should start with. Even though you can only have one character per account, don't worry because you will unlock the ability to change vocations before long. 
You don't want to do this early game because you don't want to go wasting all of your ability currency. You definitely want to stay specialized in one for a while. But if you do really, really hate the vocation that you chose, you can change it. It's not the end of the world. And also, on a little side note there, I'm not sure about on console, but on PC at least, I know it is quite easy to dig into the game files and create backups so that you can effectively have multiple characters. It's just they have to be on completely separate instances. These final few tips are all around the passage of time in this game and exactly what it does and doesn't affect in the world and what that means for you. These are so, so crucial, especially the last one. Oh, how cringe was that? Oh, tip number 16 will shock you. I, I, I didn't mean to be like that, but trust me, it is really vital. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Anyway, tip number 14 is about structures, buildings, fruit and vegetables. They may initially sound like weird things to bundle together, but broken bridges, certain pillars and columns you can collapse on enemies, and any fruit and veg that you loot will all regrow and magically repair after just a few days of in-game time. So if you have accidentally locked yourself out of an area when you accidentally destroyed the bridge, or if you've found a particularly fruitful patch of fruit that you would really like to go and re-harvest again, just remember these places, write them down, make a note for yourself, however you want to do that, and revisit in a few days. The bridges will be repaired, the fruit and veg will be back. So this is definitely a very key mechanic that you do not want to forget about. Tip number 15, just as fruit and vegetables etc will grow, your food can also go bad as the days progress. Fruit and veg will over ripen and then go rotten. Meat will also start to go bad. It will start to smell. It will give you diseases that will also go rotten. The passage of time is very crucial in this game and that applies to all things, including your rations. The one exception, however, is storage. Any items that you leave in storage are effectively frozen in time. So if you do have lots of really valuable food you want to save for when you're camping, you can put all of it in your storage and just take out one at a time to use for dinner that night once you go camping. The next day, go back to your nearest storage and take out the next one. This way, all of your food will stay fresh indefinitely. And the 16th and final tip for this video is to make sure that you try and do the majority of your quests immediately. From my testing so far, main quests do not apply to what I'm about to tell you, but pretty much every other quest in the game does. As with all other things, the passage of time affects quests and quest NPCs, and quite a few of them can and will die without your intervention. It could be something as simple as delivering a letter or agreeing to help someone train. If you don't do these things quick enough, certain unforeseen circumstances will ruin your day and kill them NPCs. One of the more obvious ones that I've been seeing all over the place is poor little Rog here. So many people get to Rog too late and he's already dead. And not only are you missing out on quests, you're missing out on lore, more importantly, for me at least, you're missing out on lots of really, really tasty quest rewards. This one in particular, if we now deliver Rog back to his grandfather, is going to give us 11,000 gold upon a few other rewards as well. Now, I'm sure later on in the game, 11k isn't that much, but at this current stage in the game, that's a full, brand new, kitted out armor set for either my Arisen or my main pawn. That is a lot of money. And if I would have left that quest for just one day and got unrested and done something else first, the wolves would have had it, Rog, he'd have died, and I would have got nothing. So check through your quest log regularly, read what your objectives are, and try and think, is this something that sounds like it's time sensitive? One of the quests that I've got, for instance, at the moment, is to track a beggar throughout his daily activities and find out how he's making so much more money than the other beggars. Yeah, okay, if I leave that too long, there is a chance he's going to die, but there have been other quests in my quest log which have sounded much more pressing and potentially life-threatening to me. 
and I can't imagine he's going to go wandering out of town and get mauled by a pack of wolves anytime soon. So that's one that's going to sit there whilst I take care of my time-sensitive ones, and I'll circle back round to that one in a day or two. And with that, my friends, that's my top 16 beginner tips, things I wish I knew sooner, whatever you want to call it, for Dragon's Dogma 2. And once again, thank you so much to Capcom for sponsoring this video. And if there's anything you've discovered that you'd like to share with the world, please let us all know down below in the comments. And with that, my friends, all that's left for me to say is thank you so much for watching. I hope you have an amazing day, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.